All right, coming in at number 10, we have Space Snakes. Dr. Musgrave is a trustworthy man, or at least his credentials suggest he must be. Not only is he a NASA astronaut, he has six degrees, and he's a doctor and a mathematician. He has made six space flights, and he believes that there is life out there. In 1994, he said, On two of my missions, and I still don't have an answer, I have seen a snake out there. What? It's not just a wee little space snake either, he said that it was 6, 7 or 8 feet long. He said that the snake followed him around for a long period of time and he tried to communicate with it. Space snakes, honestly. Dr. Musgrave thinks that they must have their own propulsion technique, which honestly is just baffling and is a can of worms or snakes. Coming in at number 9, we have asteroids. Astronaut Chris Hadfield conducted a Reddit AMA and he discussed something that scared him. He said, Sometimes we hear pings as tiny rocks hit our spaceship, and also the creaks and snaps of expanding metal as we go in and out of sunlight. The solar panels are filled with tiny holes from micrometeorites. Honestly, that really terrifies me as a person who's like a bit scared of flying in an aeroplane. This would deeply stress me out. He also said, I watched a large meteorite burn up between me and Australia, and to think of that hypersonic dumb lump of rock randomly hurtling into us instead sent a shiver up my back. Like, I'll say Chris mate, Jesus. Coming into number 8, we have The Formation. Gordon Cooper, the last American to spend time in space alone, has had a couple of very strange experiences in the skies. The first happened when he was a member of the Air Force. He was flying with other pilots in 1951 when he saw, I quote, a vast armada of UFOs flying in formation at extremely high altitudes. I'm sorry, but vast armada, that is terrifying, not just one curious UFO, a whole fleet. On top of that, in 1963, Cooper was shot into space aboard a Mercury capsule to circumnavigate the world. As he was passing Perth, he noticed a fast flying green object that was also picked up by Australian tracking systems. Now, the press were briefed that they were not allowed to talk to him about this. Why? Like, Seriously, why? Coming into number 7, we have the check mark. American astronaut Leroy Chiao was the commander of the International Space Station in 2005. During his time up there, he saw some extremely weird things. He explained his encounter to the Huffington Post by saying, I saw some lights that seemed to be in a line, and it was almost like an upside down check mark. And I saw them fly by, and I thought it was awfully strange. Could this have been the formation that Cooper was talking about? Some skeptics even tried to pass the lights off as far off fishing boat lights from Earth, but to be honest, I'm skeptical of those skeptics. Coming in at number 6, we have Magnificent Desolation. What is it like on the moon? Um, utterly terrifying according to Buzz Aldrin. Buzz, as we know, was the second man on the moon. Yes, televised recordings of the moon can be seen, and yes, we have high res photographs, but truly knowing what it feels like to be up there is something only a handful of people can talk to us about. In a Reddit AMA, Buzz Aldrin describes his experience. Experience. He said, My first words of my impression of being on the surface of the moon that just came to my mind are magnificent desolation. He continued by saying, There is no place on Earth as desolate as what I was viewing in those first few moments on the lunar surface. Beyond me, I could see the moon curving away. No atmosphere, black sky, cold, colder than anyone could experience on Earth when the sun is up. While that sounds totally incredible, it also sounds like the beginnings of a total existential. Your breakdown. Coming into number five, we have the spheres. In 1981, following the Saljut mission, the USSR cosmonaut Major General Vladimir Kolvianok gave a press conference in which he shared some very interesting information. He said that he looked out of a porthole and saw something he simply couldn't explain, something impossible to the laws of physics. He described the object he saw as spherical and elliptical, saying that it exploded into a beautiful golden light. After that, he saw two more spheres and a white smoke sphere cloud. Then then, as they flew through the Terminator, the name for the zone between light and day, he lost sight of them. Honestly, how fascinating and terrifying at the very same time. To me, it's also weird and interesting how Russia appears to be more forthcoming in discussing things that they've seen in space, whereas the United States are keen to keep a lid on it. Why do you think the United States are so heavily guarded on what they'll say about what they've seen in space? Honestly, I don't know. Coming into number four, we have the knocking. In 2003, Yang Liwai was the first. Chinese astronaut to be propelled into space. 
Now I understand the loneliness of space might send you a little bit mad, but he said one night that he heard a strange and continuous knocking. He said, and I quote, someone was knocking on the body of the spaceship just as knocking an iron bucket with a wooden hammer. It neither came from outside nor inside the spaceship. I'm sorry but honestly what? Isn't that some of the creepiest space descriptions that you've ever heard? It seems he wasn't the last to hear it either. Two further astronauts heard the same space knocks when they went up there. What are these? Coming into number three, we have the music. Listening to the transcript of the words said on board Apollo 10 is bone chilling. The spaceship passed by the dark side of the moon, and as it did, the astronauts heard a very weird ethereal music. This is what was said between Eugene Cernan, Thomas Stafford, and John Young. That music sounds out of spacey, doesn't it? Do you hear that whistling sound? Yes. Boy, that sure is weird music. We're gonna have to find out about that. Nobody will believe us. Later, Cernan said, That eerie music is what's bothering me. You know what? I hear it too. Who is going to believe it? Nobody. Shall we tell them about it? I don't know, I think we ought to think about it some. It seems that the Apollo 11 crew heard it too. What was it? We don't really know. Coming into number two, we have heat is rising in the capsule. So this is really sad and really disturbing, so do skip forward if you aren't ready for something truly terrifying. In 1967, Russian cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov did not make it back to Earth alive, something he suspected would happen when he agreed to be the solo pilot of the Soyuz 1. His spacecraft malfunctioned and he was quite aware he was going to die. Some of the last things he said can't be translated into words. He was screaming and crying words of anger. Among the last words that can be deciphered are, the heat is rising in the capsule and you've killed me. Whew, honestly, that makes me so sad. Finally, coming into number one, we have They're Watching Us. Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, had something very scary to say when he arrived at the moon in the Apollo 11 mission. It was something he spoke about once, but never spoke about again. In a secret transmission to NASA, according to the retired chief of communication system, Morris Chatelain, the first man on the moon's first words were actually, oh god, you won't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out here lined up on the far side of the crater's Edge. They're on the moon watching us. Now, this wasn't heard by the world as the broadcast was dropped for two minutes. Armstrong never spoke about it again, although a lot of credible sources have confirmed that this is what he said. Starting off this countdown, we have the fear of the unknown. During an interview with astronaut Chris Hadfield, he said that the thing he feared the most about going into space was the fear of the unknown because anything can go wrong at any time. Plus, no matter how much you prepare, there's no way you can prepare for everything that could go wrong. Because you don't know everything that can go wrong. Plus, astronauts are miles away from home with limited supplies and contact. They're pretty much on their own to save themselves if anything does go wrong. So it's the fear of not knowing what's to come that terrifies them. In our ninth spot, we have space junk. Obviously, space is filled with floating space objects, but also tons of man-made junk, like debris from old satellites, rocket ship pieces, lost equipment, you name it. It's said that there are 28 million people pieces of space debris floating around up there. That's about 6,000 tons of space debris. On top of that, each piece flies around at 18,000 miles per hour. At any second, debris could crash into the astronaut's spacecraft and wipe them out. In fact, it's said that even tiny paint flecks can damage a spacecraft when traveling at these velocities. Imagine what anything larger could do. So space junk is certainly something astronauts fear. I mean, I wouldn't be able to sleep. I would be way too paranoid. In our eighth spot, we have loss of communication. When astronauts are in space, they rely on ground control to help them out. Ground control plays a critical part in the space mission success. They make sure that everything goes as planned and that the craft stays on course. So imagine how frightening it would be to all of a sudden lose contact with them. Astronauts are then left alone just floating through space. They then would have to manually fly their spacecraft home. Astronauts have lost connection a couple of times, but it's only been for a couple of hours. Moving on to number seven, we have the toxic atmosphere. According to NASA astronaut Drew Morgan, he is worried about space's toxic atmosphere. He admitted to this on social media when responding to a comment
comment that read, What is the biggest and most terrifying thing astronauts fear about being in space? There are a number of things in space that make it so deadly for astronauts. For starters, exposure to space can cause ebolism, hypoxia, and hypocapnia. Not only that, but astronauts can get sick from being on the moon. When the Apollo astronauts returned from the moon, they got sick off of the moon dust on their spacesuits. It made their throat sore and eyes water. The particles are so fine but sharp like glass. In fact, it said that, and I quote, particles 50 times smaller than a human hair can hang around for months inside your lungs. The longer the particle stays, the greater the chance for toxic effects. But there are so many other things in space that can have a negative impact on the astronauts, like exposure to UV rays and radiation, which can cause cell mutation. Also, there's no pressure in space. The lower the pressure, the lower a liquid's boiling point is. But since in space there is no pressure, the boiling point can easily drop to an astronaut's body temperature, meaning their blood and other liquids in their body would start to boil. Not a pleasant way to go, that's for sure. In our sixth spot, we have the depressurization. Astronaut Drew Morgan claims that astronauts are also scared of depressurization. He said, and I quote, there's always the possibility that we could depressurize or that a hole could be punctured by a micrometeoroid or something and we could leak our atmosphere overboard. So let's say that an astronaut was exposed directly to the vacuum of space. Since space doesn't have atmospheric pressure, the astronauts' lungs will expand and burst. After that, the water in their soft tissues will vaporize, causing their whole body to swell up. Then bubbles would form in the veins, blocking blood flow. And the astronauts' bowels, bladder, and stomach will explode, expelling their contents. But don't worry, the astronaut would die from loss of oxygen first before all of that happens. Still, it's terrifying to think of. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with getting sick. In space, there's no hot hospitals, there's no nurses, there's no doctors. So if you get sick or injured, you're on your own. You need to rely on your crew members to help you out. This is another fear for astronauts, getting sick while in space or seeing their crew get sick while in space. Also, if one person gets sick somehow, chances are others will too. Space is a pretty germy environment. When a person sneezes on Earth, the snot particles shoot out about three to six feet and then gravity knocks them out of the air into the floor. But in space, there's no gravity. So if an astronaut sneezes or coughs, it's lingering in the air for their companions to breathe in and enjoy. As a result, sickness or diseases can spread really fast. Another fear they have is dying in orbit, because A, that would suck, and B, what are the crew members supposed to do with the astronaut's dead body? They'll be stuck living beside it for days until they return home. Has to be traumatizing. Moving on to number four, we have the mechanical failures. This is another fear that Chris Hadfield brought up that's common among astronauts. And that's fear that they will experience some sort of mechanical failure or defect, whether that be during liftoff, while in orbit, docking, or reentry. I mean, there have been a number of disasters already, like the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. In 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger broke apart 73 seconds into the flight. As a result, the shuttle broke down over the Atlantic Ocean, and all seven crew members on board lost their lives. This was due to a failure of the O-ring seal in the right solid rocket booster. In space, if their spacecraft fails or if their systems malfunction, they're pretty much screwed. So no one can come out there to save them. Moving on, number three, we have floating off into space. Although it's never happened to any astronauts so far, it's a very real fear that astronauts have. And hey, I don't blame them. Anyways, if astronauts spacewalk, they have to tether themselves down. If those tethers fail, oh boy, they're drifting out into space. No matter how much they kick or flail their arms, it won't bring them back to the shuttle. Now NASA does have these emergency jetpack things that can help fly them back to safety. But if the fuel runs out, they're in trouble. They'll be floating around for seven and a half hours until their breathable air runs out. Or until they get hit by space junk and die. Or the space junk could cause a hole in their helmet or suit and then we know what would happen, okay? So yeah, I can see why astronauts are afraid of getting separated from the spacecraft and floating away. Moving on to number two, we have the re-entry. So let's say everything goes fine. Takeoff was a success, the crew survived orbiting space and landing on the moon. Now the only thing they have left to do is come back home. You'd think that they would be excited, you know, to be back home, eating normal food, and you know, being where gravity is. Turns out returning home is something that they fear. And that's because they could burn up or get destroyed 
destroyed upon re-entry. This happened in 2003 with the Columbia Space Shuttle. Upon re-entering Earth's atmosphere, the shuttle started to disintegrate. Sadly, all seven crew members on board lost their lives. And now, if they do manage to survive re-entry, they gotta worry about landing safely instead of just crashing down full speed into the ground. And in our number one spot today, we have the catastrophe. Honestly, I never even thought about this, but according to Chris Hadfield, some astronauts are afraid of a huge catastrophe occurring on Earth while they're off the planet. Now you might think, hey, that's good. At least you weren't on the planet to witness it. But uh, hello, that means that Earth is now in ruins and their loved ones are dead. Who's going to be alive and at NASA helping them navigate back home? Chances are nobody. So they would be stuck in space, just orbiting around until they run out of supplies. And even if they did somehow re-enter Earth successfully, they're coming back home to nothing. And that's a pretty dark thing to think about. Coming in at number 10 is Vladimir Komarov. Vladimir Komarov was the first astronaut who died directly in space. This was the first mission of the Soviet Soyuz 1 spacecraft on the 23rd of April 1967. Komarov was supposed to test the ship name in manned mode and conduct the world's first docking in space with another Soyuz 2 spacecraft. However, the plan never succeeded and Komarov became the first astronaut lost in space. After the launch of the Soyuz 1 spacecraft into orbit, one of the two solar panels did not open and the spacecraft began to lack electricity for the correct system operations. Komarov tried to open the panel by spinning the ship around its axis, but this did not help. Due to the malfunction, the launch of Soyuz 2 was cancelled and the flight of Soyuz 1 was terminated ahead of schedule. The spacecraft successfully deorbited, but after re-entry for unknown reasons, the parachute system failed. As a result, the descent vehicle hit the ground at a fast speed, which resulted in the astronauts' instant death. As a result, the parachute system was modified and the shortcomings were eliminated. Number 9. Hylian Myth Even though Komarov's death is considered to be the starting point of space travel deaths, there is a myth that he was not the first astronaut lost in space. An American science fiction writer, Robert Heinlein, claimed that a similar incident took place even before Gargarian's flight into space. On May 15th, 1990, the USSR launched the Vostok 1 1KP prototype into orbit. The goal was to test the altitude control systems and the declaration engine to make sure that the ship was able to go into a descent path on the MCC command. However, the flight ended in failure. 1KP rose to a higher orbit and got stuck there for many years. Allegedly, the ship did not have life support systems, but many believed it was manned. The Western press wrote that the pilot, Gennady Zavodesky, was on board. Such a person really existed, but at that time, he was not part of the Soviet astronaut team, and Halian claimed that Soviet citizens told him about the astronaut during his visit to USSR. However, I cannot, in all fairness, prove the myth by adding this alleged death to the question of has anyone been lost in space. Number 8. Clifton Williams Clifton Williams was an American naval aviator, test pilot, mechanical engineer, major in the US Marine Corps, and a NASA astronaut who was killed in a plane crash. To be clear, he never went into space, but this was part of the space program. The crash was caused by a mechanical failure to a NASA T-38 jet trainer, which he was piloting to visit his parents in Mobile, Alabama. The failure caused the flight controls to stop responding, and although he activated the ejection seat, it did not save him. The aircraft crashed in Florida near Tallahassee within an hour of departing Patrick AFB. Number 7. X-15 Flight 191 During X-15 Flight 191 on November 15, 1967, Michael J. Adams had his seventh flight and the plane had an electrical problem followed by control problems at the apogee of its flight. Adams was an American aviator, aeronautical engineer, and USAF astronaut. He was one of the 12 pilots who flew the North American X-15, an experimental space plane jointly operated by the Air Force and NASA. On November 15, 1967, Adams flew X-15 Flight 191, also known as X-15 Flight 36597, aboard the X-15-3, one of the three planes that X-15 had in its fleet. Flying to an attitude above 50 miles, Adams qualified as an astronaut, according to the United States definition of the boundary of space. Moments later, the aircraft broke apart, killing Adams and destroying the X-15-3. He was the first American space mission fatality by the American Convention. Number 6. Apollo 1 Apollo 1, initially designed as AS-204, was intended to be the first crewed mission of the Apollo program
program, the American undertaking to land the first man on the moon. It was planned to launch on February 21st, 1967 as the first low earth orbital test of the Apollo command and service module. During a plugs out test of the Apollo hardware, which its first version could be charitably described as a flying turd, a combination of factors including overpressure, pure oxygen environment, an egress hatch that opened inward, and excessive velcro and other flammable material, plus a spark from somewhere under the astronauts couches caused a cabin fire. This happened during a launch rehearsal test at Cape Kennedy Air Force Station Launch Complex 34 on January 27th and it killed all three crew members. Three astronauts were killed likely by inhalation of toxic fumes from the velcro burning quickly. Number 5. Soyuz 11. Vlad Flokov, Gregory Dubrovlovsky, and Viktor Palsov all died in space during the Soyuz 11 mission on June 30th, 1971. The astronaut crew successfully docked with the Salute 1 orbital station and began its reactivation. On the 11th day of the mission, a fire broke out in the station, so it had to be abandoned. On June 29th, Soyuz 11 successfully undocked and began deorbiting. However, shortly after the separation from the ship, communication with the astronaut crew was interrupted. The descent vehicle landed successfully in the assigned area, but the rescue team found the astronauts dead. It was found that the astronaut death occurred as a result of depressurization and abrupt onset of decompression sickness. The astronauts tried to eliminate the air leak, however, in the extreme conditions of the fog that filled the cabin after depressurization, severe pain throughout the body, and loss of hearing due to burst eardrums, the astronauts did not immediately establish the cause of the leak and simply did not have enough time to save themselves. Number 4. Valentin Bonarenko Valentin Bonarenko was a Soviet fighter pilot selected in 1960 for training as a cosmonaut. During a 15 day endurance experiment in a low pressure altitude chamber with at least 50% oxygen atmosphere, Bondarenok, having completed work for the day, removed monitoring biosensors from his body and washed his skin with an alcohol soaked cotton ball, which he then discarded. The cotton ball landed on an electric hot plate, which he was using to brew a cup of tea. The cotton ignited, and Bonarenko tried to smother the flames with the sleeve of his woolen coveralls, which caught fire in the chamber's oxygen rich atmosphere. Because of the pressure difference, it took a watching doctor nearly half an hour to open the chamber door. Bonaranko's clothing was burned until almost all the oxygen in the chamber was used up and he had suffered third degree burns over most of his body. The attending physician at Boktkin Hospital, surgeon and traumatologist Vladimir Golahovsky, recalled in 1984 that while attempting to start an invanious drip, the only blood vessels he could find for inserting a needle were on the soles of his feet, which where his flight boots had warded off the flames. The Soviet government government concealed the death along with Bafarangso's membership of the cosmonaut corps until 1880 and a crater on the moon's far side is now named after him. Number 3. Columbia Space Shuttle Crash On the 1st of February 2003, the second space shuttle crash occurred. Shuttle Columbia was returning to Earth after 16 days of flight. Approximately 16 minutes before the expected landing, communication with the crew was interrupted. Eyewitnesses filmed the burning wreckage of the shuttle flying at an altitude of about 63 kilometers. All seven astronauts were lost in space. They were Rick Husband, William C. McCool, Elon Ramon, Michael P. Anderson, Kampla Chawa, David M. Brown, and Laurel Clark. As the investigation showed, the cause of the disaster was a breakdown that arose back at the start. About 82 seconds into the flight, a piece of insulation detached from the left fairing, which struck the carbon fiber panel of the Columbia's left wing and probably left a hole in the thermal installation layer. Because of this, after entering the dense layers of the atmosphere, the leading edge of the left wing began to heat up more than usual and the wing began to collapse and after it the shuttle itself collapsed. Notably, incidents with detached pieces of thermal insulation from the shuttles were observed before, but test shows that they do not pose a threat to the astronauts. Losing Columbia became a turning point in the space shuttle program and the shuttle astronaut flights were interrupted for several years and in 2011 the program was finally closed due to the high risk of astronauts lives. Number 2. Spaceship 2 On October 31st, 2014, another astronaut was lost in space. It was Michael Ellsbury, the pilot of the suborbital spacecraft Spaceship 2 of Virgin Galactic. During the 55th test flight of the ship, serious anomalies were discovered, which led to the spacecraft crash. The cause was called crew error. The pilot's 
unblock the tail section of the vehicle ahead of time without gaining the necessary speed and also did not perform the necessary actions to transfer the tail section to a vertical position. As a result, the ship began to rotate around its axis and then fell apart. The wreckage was scattered all over a radius of 8 kilometers. First pilot Michael Ellsbury was killed, but co pilot Peter Sebold managed to eject. The pilot astronaut survived but was seriously injured. Fortunately, the failure did not become fatal for the Richard Branson Company. Virgin Galactic worked out its bugs and in July 2021 carried out the first ever suborbital tourist space flight, ushering the area of space tourism. And coming in at number one is the Space Shuttle Challenger. In the 1980s, the era of space shuttles began, which finally established US supremacy in space. These were reusable rocket planes that made a real revolution in space tech, but still were not without significant shortcomings, which eventually became the cause of the biggest space travel disasters. Due to scheduling issues with what had been called Go Fever, STS 51L launched in suboptimal temperatures on January 28, 1986. The cold weather weakened the O rings that sealed each section of the tall, white, solid rocket booster segments and prevented the exhaust gases from shooting out of any direction but down. The seals failed over approximately 26 degrees of the arc on the starboard side of the SRB in the lowest of four segment joints. Exhaust flames escaped through the breach, pushing the SRB into the large rust colored external tank. The starboard off strut then connected the SRB to the ET, was pushed into the hydrogen tank, which shot up through the inter tank into the oxygen tank. This destroyed the ET structure entirely. The orbiter survived this event, but because of its orientation to the free flow, aerodynamic forces quickly disintegrated the orbiter. The crew compartment survived the breakup, and when recovered, it was discovered that several switches had been moved from their launch normal positions, indicating that the crew was conscious for some time after the breakup and tried to recover. The crew compartment impacted the ocean surface at a terminal velocity which was far too fast to survive, and all seven members of the crew passed away. These members were F. Richard Scorby, Michael J. Smith, Ronald McNair, Elson Orzinka, Judith Resnick, Gregory Jarvis, and Krista McClough. To this day, it is still unknown whether the astronauts were conscious at the time of impact, although it's judged unlikely. Starting off number 10 now, we have The Knocking. In 2003, Yang Liwei became the first Chinese person in space. It was a historic occasion, but it also became famous for a creepy occurrence. In 2016, Yang told an interviewer that he heard someone knocking on the outside of the spaceship on that trip. He was terrified and tried to peek out of the porthole but couldn't see anything outside. When he got back to Earth, Yang described the sound to experts. He even tried to recreate it for them, but nobody could identify it. In the years since, many people have tried to explain this strange phenomenon. Some say it could have been some space debris, but others say that this is unlikely. A space debris is few and far between. Others claim it could be the expanding and contracting of the ship due to the changing temperature of the spaceship as it orbited the Earth. Even though that's the leading theory, many people have their own theories about aliens or time travelers being responsible for the mysterious knocking sound. Moving on to number 9 now, we have alien music. In 1969, American astronauts Tom Stafford, Gene Kernan, and John Young went to the far side of the moon for the Apollo 10 mission. It was going to be the final test before Apollo 11 took three humans to walk on the surface of the moon for the first time. When the Apollo 10 astronauts were orbiting around the far side of the moon, they took photographs of its surface. As they were working away, they began to hear music. Specifically, they heard a strange whistling sound that lasted nearly an hour. When it faded away, Commander Kernan said, Boy, that sure is weird music. We're going to have to find out about that. Pilot Young replied, Nobody would believe us. And for the most part, they were right. Many people couldn't explain the sound that they claimed to have heard, and so they just didn't believe it. The leading theory is that the sound came from radio interference between spacecrafts. Some people have dismissed that though, and have insisted that the astronauts would have known the difference between radio interference and their spacey music. Coming in at number 8 now, we have Snakes in Space. In 1994, Dr. Story Musgrave did an interview where he described his career as an astronaut, and one particular time which shook him to that day. He said, On two of my missions, I still don't have an answer. I have seen a snake out there. Six, seven, eight feet long. It is rubbery because it has internal waves in it. 
it and it follows you for a rather long period of time. The more you fly in space, the more you see an incredible amount of things out there and that sort of thing brings to you really a certainty that other living creatures are out there. Now usually an account like this might be dismissed but Musgrave is a doctor, he has six academic degrees, is a trained mathematician, he was in the Marine Corps and was a NASA astronaut. He seems like a credible witness. He believes that there are advanced creatures existing in space itself and that he has even tried to communicate with them in the hopes that they come down and get him. Whatever that means. Next up at number 7 now we have docking. In 1995 famous Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield had his first space flight. His job was to relay the speed and range information to the pilot as they were docking into the Russian Mir space station. Any mistakes could have resulted in a total disaster. Too soft and they would have just bounced off. Too hard and they would have broken the space station in half, killing the three people on board. Everything was going smoothly but then one of the sensors started telling them they were 32 feet away, the other said 20 feet away, which was correct. If they didn't solve the problem in 30 seconds, it was over for them. Hadfield had to calculate how far they were away in his head, timing it with his stopwatch to decide when they should fire their thrusters. Luckily, they ended up being spot on and they docked almost perfectly. It took a few minutes before the astronauts began to realize they had done it. They were alive, they had avoided a space disaster, and they had lived to tell the tale. Moving on now to number 6 we have Impossible. On May 5th 1981 Russian cosmonaut Vladimir Kovalyanok looked out of his portal of the Salyut orbital space station. He then saw something which seemed inexplicable to him. When he returned to earth he told the world at a conference what he had seen. He said, many cosmonauts have seen phenomena which are far beyond the experiences of earth men. For 10 years I have never spoke on such things. The encounter you asked me about happened on May 5th 1981 at about 6pm during the Salyut mission. At that time we were over the area of South Africa moving towards the area of the Indian Ocean. I just made some gymnastic exercises when I saw in front of me through a porthole an object which I could not explain. I saw this object and then something happened that I could not explain, something impossible according to the laws of physics. The object had this shape, elliptical, and it flew with us. From a frontal view it looked like it would rotate in flight direction. It only flew straight but then a kind of explosion happened, very beautiful to watch, of golden light. That was the first part. Then, one or two seconds later, a second explosion followed somewhere else and two spheres appeared, golden and very beautiful. After this explosion, I just saw white smoke, then a cloud-like sphere. Before we entered the darkness, we flew through the Terminator, the twilight zone between day and night. We flew eastwards and when we entered the darkness of the Earth's shadow, I could see them no longer. The two spheres never returned. That was the end of the quote. There have rarely been descriptions so vivid and detailed and many people who hear Kovalyanok's story hold it up as proof of extraterrestrial life. Moving on now from the 5 we have Toxic. In the mid 90s Bob Kerbeen took part on his first spacewalk as an astronaut. Unfortunately disaster struck when a connector to a hose began to leak on the outside spraying toxic ammonia all over him. He couldn't get back inside the space station covered in that stuff. He managed to stay calm and he fixed the leak, but he was still contaminated. He came up with a plan. Ammonia has a low boiling point and so Bob decided to literally bake himself in the sunlight of space for an extra 30 minutes in order to vaporize the ammonia off him. He had to just sit out there in space hoping that he got all the ammonia off and that he didn't poison the crew and himself when he got back into the station. It was was a success. His plan worked, but it was one of the most surreal and scary moments an astronaut could ever experience. Next up at number 4 now we have the lights. In 2005 astronaut Leroy Chiao was commander on the International Space Station for over 6 months. He was once doing a spacewalk to repair some antennas when something caught his eye. He saw some lights that seemed to be in the line, almost like an upside down check mark. They flew right past him but his fellow astronaut didn't see because they were facing the other way. When he described the sighting to those back on the ground, they dismissed it as a fishing boat hundreds of miles below him. Chiao himself had stated that he doesn't believe there's ever been any tangible evidence that someone else is visiting earth or has done so in the past. He has simply told his story as it is and is leaving all of the explaining up to everyone else. 
Coming in at number three now, we have the drifter. Now for some people, the biggest fear they have about space is that feeling of drifting away from the space station, unable to claw themselves back. Well, Scott Parazinski may have had the closest experience to that. He was performing a spacewalk when a jammed solar panel threatened the safety of the entire space station and the crew inside. After 72 hours, NASA came up with a plan. Scott was told to travel further away from the safety of an airlock than had ever been attempted. He later said in an interview there was a real danger that we could do even worse damage to the space station. Then there was the potential of risk to myself because if there was any metal to metal connection with the solar panel or arcing, I could actually electrocute myself or cause ignition of the 100% oxygen in my spacesuit. The stakes were high, but Scott succeeded. Disaster was averted, but sadly, many of Scott's heroics are still not known by the masses. Moving on to number two now, we have the secret transmission. In 1975, retired Chief of NASA Communications Systems, Maurice Chatelaine, published his book, Our Cosmic Ancestors. In it, he made an extraordinary claim about the first manned mission to the moon. He said, Only moments before Armstrong stepped down the ladder to set foot on the moon, two UFOs hovered overhead. Edwin Aldrin took several pictures of them. Some of these photographs have been published in the June 1975 issue of Modern People magazine. Now, this claim was linked to the story that there were two minutes of radio silence after Armstrong set foot on the moon. People claim that the lost audio was of him saying, these babies were huge sir, enormous, oh god, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. Now of course, all of this is speculation. An actual recording of that audio or of those pictures has never surfaced. That either means it didn't happen at all or it's been covered up very, very well. Either way, it's a creepy story. And finally, number one now, we have the Green Bolt. Gordon Cooper was a well-known astronaut who flew on the Mercury 9 and Gemini 5 missions. He was the last American to fly alone in space. In 1963, he flew aboard the Mercury capsule for a circumnavigational trip around the world. Everything seemed to be going okay, and then, on his final orbit, as he passed over Perth, Australia, he saw a green object swing towards him at an incredible speed. At first, he thought it was just a figment of his imagination. There have been times where pilots and astronauts have seen objects like this, but their equipment detected nothing. This time was different though. The Muccia tracking station in Western Australia actually picked the object up on their radar. That was huge. Now he had something solid to back up his own experience. He reported the incident to the National Broadcasting Company. When he returned to Earth, he was eager to tell his side of the story, but Gordon claims he was approached by NBC reporters who told him they had been instructed to not question him about the sighting. All of this has only fanned the flames of a UFO conspiracy. Hey, but coming in at number 10, what came before the big Bang. So the Big Bang was what started the universe billions of billions of Earth years ago. But like, what came before that? We honestly don't really know, and our smartest minds theorize the answer is extremely simple. Stephen Hawking noted that the answer could literally be nothing. We have no observable evidence of what came before everything. I come from the Top 10 Nerd channel, and this question has been answered in different ways in comic books. In Marvel, they say that we are in a version of the cosmos, meaning there was a previous version that ended up getting destroyed and remade. But if that's the case, what's doing the destroying and the remaking? If nothing came before, then what the heck caused the Big Bang in the first place? If there was something before, what would that do to the way we think about the universe? And if something is responsible for it all, I don't know if our tiny little human brains could actually handle that. Number 9. Gravity Paradox this question is a pretty simple one, but yet it's got a lot of scientists kind of completely stumped. Why can a refrigerator magnet defy an entire planet's gravitational pull? It's basically asking why gravity can be such a strong force in the universe, but also be such a weak one in other instances. Some scientists believe that gravity may well be as strong as other forces, like electromagnetism and the force that holds the nucleus together, but they think that gravity's influence is dissipated because it leaks into extra dimensions. That's just a theory though because we actually have no idea. 
That one little question about refrigerator magnets has kind of brought the whole idea of gravity into question. If it is being dissipated into extra dimensions, that opens up way more questions than it actually answers. Obviously, I'm not smart enough to answer this question. I am, after all, just a YouTube host, not a scientist, but I would just think it's all subjective, right? Like, a planet is so huge that the things that are on the planet would have to follow different gravitational rules, right? And like a magnet is still being affected by the Earth's gravity, it's just so small in comparison that it can do its own thing? I'm literally talking out my butt right now. I, I honestly don't know what I'm talking about. We should just move on before I make myself sound more dumb than I already am. Number eight, how big is the universe? I don't know if you guys have seen that clip from Pete Holmes' stand-up routine, but he, he talks about how none of any of this makes any sense. The universe is constantly expanding and infinitely. Infinity is getting bigger. And like Pete says, that makes no freaking sense. If the universe is constantly expanding, and we know it's constantly expanding, then when posed with the question of how big the universe is, someone would be able to give you an answer. But we don't actually have a number for that because we literally don't know the shape of the universe, and we don't know the actual rate at which the universe is expanding. We just know that it is. To me, this question almost doesn't matter for most of us because even if we were to try to go to the edge of the universe, no one here can live long enough to make that journey. It takes roughly 9 to 12 years to get to Pluto, and that's just the furthest planet, yes I'm calling it a planet, in our solar system, which itself is just an extremely tiny speck in our Milky Way galaxy, which is also just a tiny speck in the vastness of the universe. It's all too big. This is what I'm basically saying here. Number seven, expansion. The last point does lead me nicely to into this next point though, which is the fact that while we know the universe is constantly expanding, we can't actually put a pin on the rate at which it is actually expanding. For the past six years, the Hubble Space Telescope has been calculating the speed at which the universe is expanding, and recently came up with what is accepted as the most precise measurement to date, except that the rate stands in direct conflict with independent measurements of the early universe's expansion. That's unsettling for astrophysicists because it means we know even less about our universe and its ways than we thought we did. But if we do learn this one, would that be a good thing? Or would it just help us all feel more and more meaningless and tiny? Of course, these are scientific questions, so our emotions about these things aren't really important, but I'm just saying, I already feel small and insignificant. Number six, the multiverse. If you have been keeping up with the MCU, then you are at least familiar with the idea of a multiverse. Essentially, it means that if you go far enough into the universe, things would have to start repeating because there's only a finite number of ways that particles can be arranged in space and time. According to theories, the universe is flat and infinite, so those particles would have to repeat, creating another universe with another Earth, and yes, another you. And because it's all infinite, there would be infinite versions of you who could be doing the exact same things as you right now, or maybe they wore different clothes today, or had a completely different job, or honestly, there are an infinite number of variables here. The thing is, we will most likely never know if this theory is true or not. And even if we did, that means there would be an evil alternate you, or maybe, or maybe, you are the evil alternate one. I don't know. I don't know about that one, man. I don't like that. Number five, what the heck is dark matter? Dark matter gives out no light, or at least too little light for us to detect. We know it exists because we see the effect of its gravity on the stars and the galaxies, like the Milky Way, which could not have dragged in enough matter to make its own stars in the 13.82 billion years since the Big Bang without there being a lot of invisible matter whose extra gravity helped speed things along. I hope that wasn't too confusing. The European Space Agency Planck satellite found that dark matter accounts for 26.8% of the mass energy of the universe compared with the 4.5% of normal atomic matter. This basically means that dark matter outweighs the visible stars and galaxies that we can actually see by a factor of about six. And yet, no Earth-based experiment has found any evidence of dark matter at all. 
and we have been looking for a long time. It's totally possible that our theory of matter, or more likely, our theory of gravity, needs to be reworked and fiddled with. It's also possible that maybe the universe is filled with dark stars and dark planets and dark life. What does that even mean? I don't know. Do you know? Because I don't. Number four, what is time and does it even exist? So, when we talk about time, we imagine it flowing like a river, like a time stream. But for something to flow, by definition, it has to flow with respect to something else, like how a river flows with respect to a river bank. So, does time flow with respect to something else? Another kind of time, maybe? I, I don't know. The idea seems kind of stupid and kind of just made up, but most likely the flow of time is an illusion that we created on our own with our brains to organize the information constantly flooding in through our senses. We also have a strong sense of a shared past, present, and future. However, the idea of a common present, meaning the time right now that everyone's in, doesn't actually exist in our understanding of relativity. Precisely how someone else's time is sliced up depends on how fast they are moving relative to you or the strength of the gravity they are experiencing. These effects are only really noticeable with things like the speed of light and super massive gravity, which is why they are not super obvious to us in everyday life. But it basically means the idea that one person's interval of time is not the same as another person's. And that one person's interval of time is not the same as another's. If you watch Interstellar, there's a pretty basic explanation of this as different members of the crew age differently as they split up to different places around a massive black hole and other planets whose gravities affect all the characters differently time-wise. It's just, my brain hurts actually a lot right now. Number three, do we have everything wrong? Isaac Newton's theory of gravity was accurate enough to fly spacecraft to the moon, but it began breaking down when extremely high speeds and very strong gravitational fields became known to us. Then, Einstein's theory of general relativity came in and was a better alternative. It correctly describes the bending of starlight by gravity, the orbital decay of binary pulsars, and the warping of space-time around a black hole. Really cool stuff like that. General relativity is currently physicists' best theory of gravity, but it doesn't answer everything, obviously, which is why history will probably repeat itself and physicists might discover small effects that would hint at an even better theory of gravity. Einstein's theory has passed most of the things that might test it with flying colors, but physicists will keep putting their theories on the rack. One day, it may even fail, not being completely wrong, but just one small part to a bigger puzzle that none of us will be alive to learn the answer to. Number two, Earth Martians. Oh boy, this one's a doozy. Okay, so look, we take it for granted that life on Earth actually began here. We just kind of assume that that's the way things worked. But that's not actually necessarily accurate. Apparently, scientists are actually finding evidence that life on Earth may have instead come from Mars, and was brought to this planet by like a meteorite at some point in Earth's incredibly long history. The trouble is that scientists themselves can't even agree on which area of science will provide the answer to this conundrum, and let alone whether science is even where we should look to answer it, which, like Pete said about the universe's expansion, that makes no frickin' sense. What do you mean? What do you mean we can what? Number one, aliens. Since the early 1960s, scientists have theorized that it's extremely likely that intelligent life exists outside of Earth, and I for one totally agree. The math kind of has to mean it's true. The universe is ever expanding, infinite, and contains countless other galaxies just like ours, with planets that would be in the similar position as ours is to their sun, and with the right conditions for life to actually thrive and grow, like the planet Kepler-186f, which you should look up if you haven't before. It's kind of cool. The trouble is that we have basically zero scientific evidence to prove that the life could potentially exist or does in fact exist. In fact, we have no hard scientific evidence that any life exists outside of Earth. Although with that planet, we actually just can't see that far down onto like the surface of the planet to see what's going on. So it could be there, we just can't see it. Although we are finding some fun stuff on Mars that may say otherwise. The time may be drawing closer and closer to when science confirms that there is life elsewhere in our solar system or the galaxy, or at least somewhere in the universe. And I really hope I'm alive for that. The thing that gets me though is, 
if whatever is out there is advanced enough to see us too, and if it is advanced enough to see us, then is it advanced enough to make it here? And if that's the case, then um, we are not as advanced as that, and we should stand no chance in defending ourselves against something like that, assuming they would want to hurt us, which as humans, we would just assume they would, and if they didn't, I think our stupid human brains wouldn't be able to handle the fear of not knowing, and we'd do something dumb like attack them, and then we'd be gone because we just can't stand up to that kind of thing, you know what I'm saying? Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Almaz. Almaz was a super secret Soviet military space station program that began in the early 1960s. Basically, there were three separate stations that were launched between 1973 and 1976, and they were crewed military recon stations. How they kept the whole thing more under wraps is that they designed them like civilian space stations. One of the stations failed shortly after achieving orbit, but the last two both were successful in their crew testing. Although there was success on these flights, the cost associated with them and the benefits Benefits of the program weren't matching up, so in the end, it didn't go further than there. Although the technology used in this program has, of course, gone on to inform others. In our number nine spot today, we have Long March 2F. Last year in 2020, China claimed to have successfully launched and tested a quote reusable spacecraft, which is said to be a space plane that could be the key to frequent and low-cost access to space, which is a crazy thing to say. While this is very exciting and could potentially help space exploration in very valuable ways, it is said that this particular mission still has quite a bit of mystery surrounding it. It is said that while the launch was viewed by people, the exact nature of the craft itself as well as what it did in space isn't quite clear. An unnamed military source that was quoted by the South China Post apparently said that there were many firsts during this launch, which is why everything is so secretive and secure. At the end of the day, all we can do is sit back, watch, and see what happens. Who knew there was so much drama in the space world? Well, I kind of I guess everyone did. I mean, take a look at the space race. In our number eight spot today, we have Corona. Speaking of the space race, if you're unfamiliar, it was the 20th century competition between the Soviet Union and the United States, and it certainly was something that the world had never seen before. Basically, it was each country trying to one up each other on space flight technology and capabilities, and while this competition had its origins in the missile based nuclear arms race, it also managed to create a lot of technological advancements in the world of space exploration. Doing recon was truly one of the first priorities of both of these countries when it came to actually going to space, and that is why from 1960 to 1972, a recon project with the now terrible nickname Corona was put into effect. Basically, this project was a series of strategic recon satellites that were produced and operated by the CIA Directorate of Science and Technology with additional help from the US Air Force. So basically, the most incredible minds and those with the highest security clearances were in on this top secret mission. These satellites were then used to provide photographic surveillance of both the Soviet Union and China. Basically at the time, everyone was really worried about nuclear power and this gave them the opportunity to peek behind the curtain and see what was really going on. In our number 7 spot today, we have Spaceship One. On July 26, 2007, there was an explosion that occurred at a rocket propulsion test site at the Mohave Air and Spaceport in California. This explosion caused the death of three people and three others had to be hospitalized for serious injuries. While there were details released about this event, the exact specifics of how this happened were kept shrouded in mystery for quite some time. Basically, the explosion occurred just three seconds after the start of a cold flow test of nitrous oxide, or laughing gas. The test was because, during the planned suborbital space trips, the nitrous oxide would then be used as an oxidizer to ignite a fuel of solid rubber, and the test was to check that the fuel system plumbing works, and it wasn't meant to ignite anything. There were about seven people there for the test, but most of them were behind a barrier that is used when testing things like rockets. Because of the nature of the test, there would seemingly be no reason for it to explode, but it obviously still did, and the reason as to how and why was kept a secret from the public. In our number 6 spot today, we have Xijiang 21. Not too long ago, China launched a satellite called Xijiang 21, designed to test new ways to clean up space debris, which is super cool and actually really important. This is all fine and well, but here's where the mysterious part comes in. Basically, something else has joined in orbit with the satellite, and the US Space Force detected and catalogued it, and while they thought they knew what it was, it turns out that they don't because it's not acting as expected. They thought it was a type of rocket body, 
but now they're just left with more questions than answers. Now there are doubts about whether it even is this rocket body or if it is an entirely different object and regardless, what is the plan with it? This is all a precarious situation as many world powers are testing out certain anti-satellite technologies which of course would be problematic for all the other countries. There's a good chance that we will likely never know the entire truth about the purpose of what the object trailing Xianjiang 21 is, but it's for sure keeping the Air Force on the lookout, and the rest of us can just sit and speculate and hope it's nothing bad for us. In our number 5 spot today we have the fallen astronaut. This isn't exactly a space mission, but it is something that happened in space and not a lot of people know about it, and it certainly was not something NASA knew about before it took place. The fallen astronaut is an aluminum sculpture that was meant to depict an astronaut in a spacesuit. The piece was commissioned and placed on the moon by the crew of the Apollo 15 on August 1st, 1971. It is next to a plaque that lists the 14 names of the men who died, and the entire thing is meant to be a tribute and to commemorate the astronauts and cosmonauts who have died in the advancement of space exploration. This wasn't cleared prior to being done, but I think the important thing is that it was done. The sacrifice of those people cannot be overstated, and it was for the benefit of us all. Those people were brave and brilliant, and they deserve to be commemorated in the best way possible. On the moon itself. In our number 4 spot today we have X-37B. In 2009 at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, they received a mysterious visitor at the Air Force's super secret X-37B space plane returned from orbit. This space plane went on a record breaking mission as the unmanned spacecraft was in orbit for the last 780 days before autonomously returning to Earth. While we obviously know about the return of this craft, we will likely never know about exactly what went on. The most information we have is that the Air Force research laboratory used the space plane as an orbital platform to conduct highly classified experiments. That is both super cool and super terrifying. Apparently the space plane deployed a few small satellites and the experiments were meant to test different technologies from avionics to advanced propulsion systems. The return of this space plane actually marked the fifth successful mission for the plane which is super impressive. While being very secretive this plane captured the attention of many amateur spy satellite hunters but it proved to be difficult to keep tabs on because the space plane had the ability to alter its orbit in space. That means it requires a lot of vigilance to keep track of, exactly like a super secret plane should. In our number 3 spot today we have Artemis 1. This one is less of a top secret mission and more so on the side of being one you maybe haven't heard of because it hasn't quite happened yet. Artemis 1 is a planned, uncrewed test flight that's a part of NASA's Artemis program. The Artemis program is a United States led international human space flight program. Basically the goal is to return human to the moon, most specifically the south pole area of the moon. The aim is to have humans there by 2025 and if successful, this would be the first crewed lunar landing mission since Apollo 17 that took place in 1972. That's wild! There's people in space right now and we haven't taken a trip back to the moon since 1972? I'm just glad we're working on heading there. Artemis 1 is expected to launch no earlier than February of 22, but it is likely to get pushed back until the summer. And while we wait with bated breath, making sure everything is fully prepared for the mission is more important than rushing. This mission will be the first flight of the Orion MPCV, and it will be the certification for the Orion spacecraft as well as the Space Launch System launch vehicle to see if they are ready for crewed flights. If all goes well, crewed flights will begin with the second flight test, Artemis 2. In our number 2 spot today we have an entanglement. Not too long ago, actually just over a week ago as of filming this video, Russia successfully launched a classified military satellite that is said to be a part of Moscow's early warning anti-missile system. Just shortly after this, like we're talking just hours after this, China also had a space launch. They launched their Xi'an 11 satellite into space, which is thought to be in a testing or trial phase right now, with its eventual mission being kept a secret. While all of this is of course fine and well, the one concerning thing is that people are starting to speculate that perhaps these missions might be linked, and that there is a possibility that Russia and China are working together out in space. Who knows really, and there's a high chance that this is just a space coincidence, and I'm not trying to start a space gossip 
gossip column. Either way, whatever this test satellite is that China launched, we don't know what it will one day be used for, but we can all wait together because whatever it is, it's likely to be probably exciting. In our number one spot today, we have the Manned Orbiting Laboratory. Okay, so you remember the Soviet Union secret Almaz mission we talked about at the beginning of this video in number 10? Well, here's another mission that was like in response to that. Basically, this program called the Manned Orbiting Laboratory was run by the Air Force and the intelligence community's National Reconnaissance Office, and the goal of it was to spy on and throw the Soviet Union off track. Some of the documents in this mission have now been declassified, and according to them, one of the goals was to knock some of Moscow's satellites out of orbit or to fire projectiles at them. They even wanted to try and capture one of the Soviet satellites in space and then basically send it back down to Earth so that they could study it. That's wild! And here's the thing that I couldn't tell you before about the Almaz that I can tell you now. Moscow equipped their secret space station with a rapid fire cannon in order to stop any of this from happening. I seriously feel like I'm watching some sort of space action movie. I can't believe these are real things that happened and were created in the 60s and 70s of all the times. At number 10, Marsquake. On May 5th, 2018, NASA launched the InSight Mars Lander and it was designed to give the planet its first thorough checkup since being formed. This technology allows us to collect lots of data like hearing what's going on inside of the planet. Compared to Earth, the interior of Mars is fairly quiet, but it still experiences quakes underneath the surface. The InSight Lander is equipped with a seismometer called Seismic Experiment for Interior Structure, or they just call it size, which picks up on the different vibrations vibrations of the planet and allow scientists to hear what the heck is going on inside. In April 2019, the size got its first hit which turned out to be, for the first time ever, a Mars quake. This is the first recorded trembling that appears to have come from inside the planet as opposed to being caused by forces above the surface, like wind. Most people are familiar with quakes on Earth which are caused by the moving of tectonic plates. Mars does not have tectonic plates like the moon, but they both still experience quakes. In this case, they are caused by a continual process of cooling and contraction that creates stress. The stress then builds over time until strong enough to break the crust. The audio of the quake is very ominous sounding, almost like a really strong wind, but since space is so silent, it makes things super ominous. It's not so terrifying until you remember it's coming from inside of the planet. Number 9. The Sun Considering space is such a quiet place, it really seems like everything in it makes a lot of noise. The Sun is no exception. I was totally happy before this video not thinking about the Sun making noise but now I'm afraid it's all I will be able to think of. The sun has so much energy coming out of it that it vibrates on multiple frequencies at once, which then cause a humming sound. To me, the sun sounds like one of those singing bowls used in meditation. It's almost soothing until you remember that you're listening to the sun vibrate. NASA explained how we're able to hear the sun and basically when anything material moves, waves travel through it and the same thing happens inside the sun. Those waves are bouncing around the sun and if our eyes were sensitive enough, we could actually see this jiggle. Since our human eyes are so useless and weak, scientists turn that jiggle into a sound. Like Mars, we want to know what's going on inside, and thanks to the sun vibrating at many different frequencies, we can use those vibrations to look inside. Now scientists can see huge rivers of solar material flowing around and are starting to finally understand the layers of the sun. Number 8. Crossing Saturn's Rings October 15, 1997 marks the day that the Cassini Huygens was launched. Commonly just called Cassini was a space research mission by NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Italian Space Agency to send a space probe to study the planet Saturn and its systems, including its rings and natural satellites. Cassini was the fourth space probe to visit Saturn and the first to enter its orbit where it stayed from 2004 to 2007. During this mission, one of the things they discovered, unfortunately, was what it sounds like to cross the planet's rings. Saturn's rings are made up of billions of small chunks of ice and rock coated with other materials such as dust. The audio clip sounds mainly like static but as it goes, you can hear more action and the sound becomes more intense. It's almost like the sound of a really heavy rain. Cassini's initial dive into the void of Saturn's rings was on April 26, 2017, when the sounds were recorded. Not only was this our first time hearing what this section of space sounds like, it's the first time a spacecraft has ever ventured into the gap between the planet and its rings. The sound is so loud, it's hard to believe that scientists were surprised to see just how empty it was. At number 7, Earth Whistle. This sound is terrifying because it sounds like something straight out of a video game. Space is far from empty and as we are learning today, it's not very quiet either. Space contains energetic charged particles governed by magnetic and electric fields and it behaves
behaves like nothing we've ever experienced on Earth before. Particles are continually tossed to and fro by the motion of various electromagnetic waves known as plasma waves. The plasma waves create a rhythmic noise that, with the right tools, we can hear across space. Basically, the waves create distinct sounds depending on the plasma they travel through. For example, the region tight around the Earth called the plasmosphere is pretty dense with cold plasma. Waves traveling inside the region might sound much different to those outside of it. Beyond the plasma sphere where it's warmer, waves can create a high pitched chirping sound like a flock of noisy birds. If you look up Earth whistle, it sounds like the classic laser gun sound effect or like crickets and frogs at night. Either way, it sounds fake and it's hard to believe it was recorded right by Earth in space. Number 6 Jupiter Everyone thinks aliens live on Mars. Due to its similarities to Earth, maybe it is the one housing another life form. I would agree it makes a lot of sense that aliens are hanging out on Mars. That was until I heard what it sounds like on Jupiter. I mentioned earlier Cassini, the spacecraft that was sent on a mission to check out Saturn. Well, Cassini had a historic 20 year mission to Saturn, and while in space, it stopped by Jupiter to receive a gravitational boost en route to its final destination. Cassini flew by Jupiter in January 2001 while it was flying by. It captured some spooky alien like radio signals. Of all the sounds on this list, the ones on Jupiter sound the most like aliens. The other sounds were spooky, but this one sounds almost animated, perhaps like a conversation even. Apparently, the sound comes from waves that were derived from an interaction of the magnetic field that surrounds Jupiter and the solar wind of particles speeding away from the sun. At number 5, unusually close signals. There are bright, fleeting blasts of radio waves coming from the vicinity of a nearby galaxy, and they are only pushing one of astronomy's biggest mysteries even further from an answer. The repeating bursts of energy seem to be coming from an ancient group of stars called a globular cluster. What's so special about that? Well, it's one of the last places astronomers expected to find them. These extremely bright and extremely brief bursts of radio waves are known as fast radio bursts or FRBs. Originating billions of light years away, the FRBs have defied explanation since they were first spotted in 2007. Based on observations, scientists infer that the bursts are powered by young, short lived cosmic objects called magnetars. That was until a couple of years ago when a fast radio burst was discovered and traced to a globular cluster about 11.7 million light years away near the neighboring spiral galaxy M81. At number 4, Space Roar In space, nobody can hear you scream, but scientists did pick up on what they described as a roar. I don't know if you could find a scarier sound coming from space. Back in 2006, scientists began looking for distant signals in the universe using a complex instrument attached to a huge balloon that was sent to space. The instrument is called the Absolute Radio Meter for Cosmology, Astrophysics, and Diffuse Emissions, or just Arcade. The Arcade was able to pick up radio waves from the heat of distant stars, but none of them were expecting what they heard next. The instrument listened from a height of about 23 miles, and it picked up a signal that was six times louder than what it had originally been expected. They tried to source the loud sound, but soon discovered it was too loud to be early stars and far louder than the predicted combined radio emission from distant galaxies, so basically scientists were stumped. Even today, we still have no idea what the source of the roar was. Apparently on top of not knowing the source, the mysterious sound is so loud that it's making the efforts to search for signals from the first stars formed after the Big Bang quite difficult. It's just out there covering up our view of early stars and being emitted by something we can't yet imagine. Number 3 Space Heartbeat Mystery Mysterious radio signals from space have been known to repeat, but a few years back, for the first time, researchers noticed a pattern in a series of bursts coming from a single source half a billion light years away from Earth. Fast radio bursts, or FBRs, which I mentioned before, are millisecond long bursts of radio waves in space. Individual radio bursts emit once and don't repeat, but repeating FRBs are known to send out the waves multiple times. Usually when they repeat, it's sporadic or in a cluster according to previous observations. Between September 16, 2018 and October 30th, 2019, researchers with the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment or CHIME detected a pattern in bursts occurring every 16.35 days. Over the course of 4 days, the signal would release a burst or two each hour, then it would go silent for another 12 days. In 2019, Chime detected the sources of eight new repeating fast radio bursts, including this signal. The repeating signal was traced to a massive spiral galaxy around 500 million light years away. Researchers hoped that by tracing the origin of these mysterious bursts, they would be able to determine what caused them, but to this day, scientists still have no idea. I know I mention aliens a lot, but come on. If anything is another life form trying to get in communication with us, it has to be this. What else would be able to stay so consistent in space? 
Number two, Jupiter's bow shock. Well, we all know now that I think Jupiter's home to aliens already, but after hearing Jupiter's bow shock, I don't know if I'm more or less convinced. The sun emits a steady stream of charged solar wind, which can be repelled by a very strong magnetic force, like that of the magnetic field of a larger planet. When the solar wind meets a strong magnetic force surrounding a planet, it's deflected, and all its energy of motion is converted to thermal energy. This energized region is known as a bow shock. The name is borrowed from a similar phenomenon in aerodynamics. The sound of passing through this region was recorded by the Voyager spacecraft. Voyager 1 and 2 were both launched into space in 1977 to take advantage of a favorable alignment of Jupiter and Saturn. When the spacecraft encountered the bow shock, there was a very sudden burst of intense low frequency emissions extending over a wide range of frequencies. To me, the bow shock on Jupiter sounds like the little aliens are just chilling, chattering away, and then explosion. It sounds like something big blows up, and the tone of it is much deeper than the high pitch of Jupiter itself. Once again, remembering that the sound was recorded in space makes it even crazier. And at number one, black hole. Okay, of all the sounds you can hear from space, a black hole is the scariest. I think also just in general, black holes are one of the scariest things that exist. First of all, what the heck is a black hole? Well, according to NASA, a black hole is a place in space where gravity pulls so much that even light cannot get out. Horrifying. The gravity is so strong because the matter has been squeezed into a tiny space. This can happen when a star is dying. Because no light can get out, people can't see black holes. They are invisible. Space telescopes with special tools can help find black holes. The special tools can see how stars that are very close to black holes act differently than other stars. The sound that a black hole makes is even more haunting. I've never heard a more fitting sound effect for a spine chilling scene in a horror movie. It sounds like what I think hundreds of ghosts and spirits would sound like if they were to circle around a spooky dungeon. Maybe it's just me, but I seriously think it's the sound they used in Harry Potter when they were at Azkaban. Number 10, Mariner 1. July 22nd, 1962, an Atlas rocket launch was successful successful at first. NASA's Mariner 1 spacecraft had hoped to be the first to fly by Venus and get ahead of the Soviet Union in this massive space race. Now after the launch, it didn't take long for operations to quickly go south. The rocket was unable to steer itself and was heading towards a crash rather than the cosmos. Now there's two things that could happen here. The rocket either lands into the North Atlantic shipping lanes or an inhabited area. Not ideal, so there's no choice other than to self-destruct. $720 million splashed down minutes later. It turns out this was all caused because one programmer left a hyphen out of one equation. That's how long ago it was, where one hyphen just caused all that damage. Classic. Number nine, Phobos 1. 1998, we'll look over to the Soviet Union for this one. We'll go back and forth. Back in 1998, they launched the Phobos 1 spacecraft to study Mars's moons and even land a probe on Phobos, the largest moon of them. Now on September 2nd, 1998, mission operators lost contact with the spacecraft and they never heard back. Yeah, it just goes them and then drifted away in space. That's that's a bit rude if you ask me. So what went wrong? Where did it go? Well, software uploaded on August 29th. Well, it turns out somebody missed a single character when they uploaded software on August 29th. Again, a single character caused all this chaos. This put the spacecraft in a steering test mode for some reason, which also deactivated the spacecraft's thrusters, so eventually the solar panels couldn't face the sun anymore and it ran out of battery power and also communication. Drifted away forever and then just died. That's so sad. Number eight, the second shortest spacewalk. Luca Parmitano, an Italian astronaut with the European Space Agency, faced what's possibly my new worst fear. Here we go. July 16th, 2013, not that long ago at all. During a spacewalk on the 36th expedition to the ISS, the International Space Station, Luca's helmet began to fill with liquid. Not water, but rather liquid coolant. Water would be bad alone, just splashing around in zero G, but liquid coolant, you can't even drink that. Know what I mean? I mean, as if you could drink water in the suit, like it's Looney Tunes. Both are bad. The spacewalk continued for over an hour before Luca was back in the ISS and free from his suit of doom. Yeah, he was fine, but this accident could have been a lot worse. The second shortest spacewalk in the station's history. More than fair. Drowning in a weird liquid around your head? I couldn't even imagine. That's my new nightmare. Yep. Number seven, space workout gone wrong. Look, zero gravity. I can't even imagine how hard it is to stay in shape while you're floating on the ISS, just in space. It's funny to watch astronauts work out while they're strapped down to a treadmill, but it's vital for that return trip later on after the space mission is complete. They land back on Earth and they're like, oh yeah, gravity, oops. You know, gotta keep those legs nice and strong. 
Working out in zero gravity can have its dangers. Back in 1995, astronaut Norman Thagard was working out, getting his lunar leg day in, doing some knee bends, all that good stuff. But while doing so, one of the straps snapped off of his foot and flew upwards, hitting him in the eye. Yeah, gravity or not, that's gonna leave a mark. Thagard then had trouble looking at light from that point on, which when you're in space, that's really not ideal. Just trying to avoid the sun as it's going around you all day long, oh, that's exhausting. Steroid eye drops helped Thagard's eye ultimately, but it could have been a lot worse. Imagine losing an eye in space. Thor lost an eye in space, you know what I mean? Thor, that's pretty badass either way. Number six, Apollo 1. The first fatal accident in the history of US space flight happened on January 27th, 1967. The first manned mission of the Apollo space program. Now, it happened. During a simulated launch, a fire broke out in the command module of Apollo 204 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, ultimately taking the lives of astronauts Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Caffey. Design flaws in the hatch door made it impossible to open in time to save the astronauts. So it was honestly just terrible, terrible situation. Apollo 13 faced issues as well in 1970 when an oxygen tank failed. The crew was supposed to head out to the moon, but they had to obviously return once faced with these impossible tasks. Ron Howard did a movie about it called Apollo 13. Done very well, but again, I, nothing can compare it to the real situation, I bet. God, that's so scary. Anything like, all these sound terrifying, don't get me wrong, but like the fact they're happening in space or in like a really tight enclosed area, I'm sweating talking about it. Number five, Soyuz 11. It was April 1971 when the Russians launched the world's first space station, Salyut 11. Three cosmonauts aboard said space station spent three weeks observing, conducting experiments, dare I say, normal space station behavior. But their return trip, however, on June 30th, that's when things took a tragic turn. The spacecraft made a normal re-entry and a normal landing, but when the ground team opened up the hatch, all three cosmonauts had suffocated. See, what happened was a faulty air vent had opened 30 minutes prior when the descent module separated and the cabin just depressurized, just like that. And from that point on, the Soviet and US space programs would now ensure that their astronauts are always wearing their spacesuits during any phase of any mission where depressurized pressurization could possibly occur. Just to be safe, yeah, that's, ah, oh, it's terrifying. This is so terrifying. I'm literally sweating doing this list. Couldn't imagine how scary that would be. Number four, Project 1794. This project was created with the goal to build a sort of saucer type aircraft that would be designed to shoot down Soviet attacks. Now the program, which was created in the 1950s, was quite ambitious and had some pretty lofty goals. A team of engineers began trying to build a disc shaped aircraft, but here's the real kicker. They wanted it to be capable of traveling at super Sonic speeds at high altitudes. The documents about this project show that they wanted to be able to travel at Mach 4, which is four times the speed of sound, and they wanted it to be able to reach an altitude of over 100,000 feet. At the time, the project was estimated to cost around $3 million, which is around 26 million today. And in the end, of course, the project was canceled in 1961 because the craft failed tests and proved to be aerodynamically unstable, which of course would provide a whole slew of problems going at those high speeds. Yeah, especially supersonic speeds. There goes all of our money and equipment. There we go, just scattered all over the desert. Number three, too fast. We're at this stage in life where Teslas are driving themselves and they're driving people to work while they're just chilling on their phones. Not for me, I'm a 10 and two guy forever. That's hands on the wheel, I'm controlling everything. Cause you never know what technology may or may not do, what choice it may or may not make for you. I don't know. On June 4th, 1996, for example, Europe's Ariane 5 rocket launched successfully, but 37 seconds into the flight, the rocket flipped 90 degrees, just out of nowhere. And the onboard computer triggered the self-destruct mechanism just two seconds after that point. Yeah, it just made that call for us. Rather than the launch that we heard earlier where a human made that call, this rocket knew it was going too fast and it dipped. The investigation revealed that some sort of old code wasn't properly adapted for the new Ariane 5. Old code for the Ariane 4 was used for the new body on Ariane 5. That equals problems. Now in this case, the engineers had decided that specific velocity in question was too high to become a real problem. That was only true for the Ariane 4, so things did not work. You live and you learn. Number two, 2001 Genesis. I've personally never been skydiving before because I'm afraid of heights. I don't think I could ever do it. But I'm also so worried about the parachute not opening. I mean, I know that's an obvious, but it's a very real problem and one that we'll sometimes see in NASA projects, believe it or not. NASA's Genesis spacecraft launched in 2001, but it was 2004 when it faced issues. When the solar wind sample carrying probe was descending back to our home base here on Earth, the parachute chute never deployed. It just smashed down to earth. Remaining samples were contaminated by the desert air. Other samples were of course destroyed 
on this impact. It was a whole mess. NASA's failure report later on in 2009 then revealed that manufacturers had incorrectly installed the probe's accelerometers into an inverted position. So the spacecraft thought it was going up when really it was going down. Yeah, it's a big yikes. Took five years to get answers. Nobody parachutes for five years. That's the new rule. And finally, number one, the Challenger disaster. There's an entire series on Netflix about this entire situation. It's hard to watch, but it's way more informative than I can be in, you know, 45 seconds. On January 28th, 1986, barely a minute after the space shuttle Challenger lifted off, a malfunction in the spacecraft's rubber seals that separated its rocket boosters caused a fire. And from that point on, everything happened so fast. The blaze quickly spread up the rocket itself, and the disaster led to the deaths of all the astronauts on board, including the life of a teacher, Krista McAuliffe. With it being minus three degrees Celsius, the engineering team predicted some sort of failure, but NASA had already delayed this project multiple times, so they wanted to press on anyways. The disaster resulted in the temporary suspension of the space shuttle program. More than fair. Again, if you haven't seen the documentary on Netflix, it's really informative. It's sad, obviously, but it's good to know. In our number 10 spot, we have an alien interaction. Have you ever come across someone that so clearly lied, but they tried to cover it up with a joke? Or perhaps they were so clearly telling the truth and they decided to mask it as it's a joke. Well, that could very well be the case for astronaut Scott Kelly, except I'm not quite sure if he was masking the truth with his words. I'll let you decide. Apparently, Scott Kelly spent quite a lot of time on the International Space Station. He is known as the astronaut that has stayed the longest in the space station. Scott has apparently made a few UFO slash alien jokes in his time that has raised some eyebrows. At one point, he was quoted as saying that, Aliens have it easier in space than we do. First off, that is not a joke. If he thinks that's a joke, I think we need to sign him up for a class at Second City. But second, excuse me sir, but what does that mean? Have you seen aliens in space seemingly live comfortably? Was he told to say that he was joking because he could have revealed a top secret if he elaborated? Possibly. If you're liking this video, don't forget to subscribe for good vibes and more content like this. In our number nine spot, we have UFO footage. Here is some crazy footage that NASA has dismissed. It's so clear that there's something going on here and the complete disregard for crazy footage like this truly makes you feel like, what else are they keeping from us? In 2020, Russian cosmonaut Ivan Wagner made a time-lapse video while orbiting space and he claimed to have found something. Space guests, he called them. In his video, you see the curved edge of the earth at night with a green swirl of the aura moving across the surface and several falling stars. It's such a cool video to see. Then about nine seconds in you see a fleet of five possible UFOs. He said that because it's in a time lapse format you can't measure how long they were there but it was for about 50 seconds real time. This video is so nuts. I'm so happy that this astronaut decided to share this with the world. At least we know that some of them are on a quest for truth and are not keeping us from seeing crazy evidence. In our number 8 spot we have new planets. Not too long ago, it was released to the public that a possible batch of Earth-sized planets were discovered and apparently three of them could possibly support human life. Yeah, my mind is blown too. Some scientists are on board with the evidence and some are dismissing it, which makes it confusing to us little guys that don't know what's going on and really just want to know if aliens exist or not. <laughs> Let's be real. We've been kept out of important discoveries before only to have seen evidence years later when they've been declassified. People believe that's what will happen in this case. Perhaps not only were these planets discovered, but possibly aliens in life as well. These planets have been called the Trappist-1 planets and the whole discovery just feels fishy to me. As if people are dismissing the evidence to cause confusion so that no one knows what's real and are distracted by the confusion. In our number 7 spot, we have the Flat Earth Theory. Many people believe that the spherical Earth is a lie and that NASA has been faking the whole thing. They believe that all of the photos of the globe are photoshopped for financial gain. I'm not sure I'm on board with this one, but let's discuss why people think this is a lie. It is believed that it would cost much less to fake a space program than to actually have one, and the funding that NASA gets goes to the people behind the sham. 
whoa, imagine. NASA has thousands of employees though, so logically, it would be pretty hard to fake it from that many people. Unless, of course, you had everyone work on projects that are top secret and they aren't allowed to tell their co workers what they're working on. Like I said, not sure I'm fully on board with NASA lying about this one, but if this lie were proven to be real, there would probably be some kind of civil war, because I bet people would be furious. In our number six spot, we have the gray thing. Here we have another case of is this astronaut a liar or is this a true story? This is a story told by an anonymous online user that claims to be an astronaut who once saw an alien in an underground US base. He claimed to have been traveling through a US base that he didn't want to name as there is only a number of people allowed in and he doesn't want to be tracked. At this base, he saw a person that was gray and he was definitely not from this planet. Obviously. <laughs> when out in space, he had seen a fleet of aircraft that he knew were UFOs, but he didn't think we had any contact with them yet. It wasn't until that moment that he realized that not only do we have contact with them, but also the aliens are actually already living among us. Interesting. Well, there are so many quote unquote whistleblowers that have mentioned gray people, so this story could be true. Some think it to be a lie, some don't. I think that there are only a handful of people that have gone to space, so it would be easy to find the culprit, and this would be a very risky move on their part. What do you think? In our number five spot, we have UFO in orbit. This story is crazy to me because two astronauts by the name of James Lavelle and Frank Borman once claimed that they had seen a UFO, but NASA dismissed it. NASA claims that the story isn't true and it is clear that they have tried to bury it. They said that what these two men saw were just the booster rocket nearby, but they both said that what they saw was a fleet of UFOs and the booster in sight. It was not the booster according to them. They were UFOs and the booster. Look, personally, I don't see a reason for them to lie, other than maybe if they were hoping for a future book deal. But honestly, just the very fact that they have gone to space would automatically make them cool enough for a book deal, and I'm sure a publishing house would say yes. So I can't think of any reason why they would be motivated to lie. So I believe them. There's so much out there that we don't know yet. We might as well stay open and believe the actual people that went to space when they say that they've seen something. In our number four spot, we have enormous babies. There have been many reports from NASA employees of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin seeing aliens when they first arrived on the moon. They have said that this is a lie and that they never ever said anything about big babies, but a lot of people believe differently, as if they wouldn't have been bought off by someone who would want to keep it a secret, am I right? <laughs> A former NASA employee by the name of Otto Binder unnamed radio hams with his own VHF receiving equipment, bypassed NASA's broadcasting and picked up the following being said by Neil in response to NASA asking, what's there Apollo 11? The response, these babies are huge sir, enormous, oh my god, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you there are other spacecraft out there lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. Allegedly, off the record, the two astronauts did admit to many scientists that they indeed saw something. I could get on board and believe that they probably did see something and then proceeded to lie about it, <laughs> but I doubt they would lie out of malicious greed if they did. It would have been probably due to following orders, let's be real. In our number three spot, we have, is the sun as big as we think? <laughs> This is a theory I had never heard about before researching this video. Apparently there are people that believe that NASA astronauts have lied to us in regards to what they know about the sun. Again, such an odd thing to lie about and also, what for? For what purpose? <laughs> Why would they need to lie about this? But anyways, the theory is that the sun is actually much closer and smaller than NASA has told us. A conspiracy theorist said this, quote, clear photographs of the sun used in textbooks are always produced with modern telescopes containing the necessary devices used to view the sun properly. The telescope manufacturers along with the organizations which use the telescopes, those very organizations which propagate the moon hoax have an interest in there being a sun and so their evidence cannot be accepted as authentic. 
Huh. So it's believed that the telescopes have changed the look of the sun due to a financial interest? Yeah, they lost me. <laughs> but who knows, perhaps what we know about the sun is a lie. That would suck, but I don't rule out anything these days. In our number two spot, we have moon people. In November of 2021, China thought that they were on the precipice of making one of the world's biggest discoveries. Moon people, actual aliens on the moon. But honestly, they were either lying to themselves and really wanted to believe it, or they are lying to all of us right now. Dun, dun, dun. Basically, the U-2 to moon rover captured a mystery hut on the moon. But basically, it was revealed in January 2022 that this hut was just a crater rim. <laughs> but was it? Was it just a crater rim? Or was it actually aliens, but we the public have been told otherwise? If they really did make a mistake, it's pretty funny to think that they thought a crater rim was actually a hut for aliens. <laughs> In our number one spot, we have the Freemasons. Ever heard the theory that the government has been infiltrated by the elite with their own personal agendas? Well, some people believe that to be in the case of NASA. People believe that the oldest secret society has infiltrated NASA and therefore it is possible that the information may be corrupted and previous slash present astronauts may lie about their experiences in space. Where do people get this idea from? Well, allegedly Buzz Aldrin had connections to the Freemasons, and so did Edgar Mitchell of Apollo 14 and Don Izzel of Apollo 7, apparently James Irwin as well. Another theorist pointed out that NASA has symbols that are tied into the Freemasons. They pointed out that the United States is represented by the Eagle and so are the Freemasons, and the US was the first on the moon. All of this could be a stretch, or it could be connected. Whether all of this is a coincidence or not, who knows, but it sure makes you think. Kicking off the list at number 10, Wasp96B. Okay, we have to talk about some James Webb goodness in this list, of course. NASA just released a handful of photos from its $10 billion project. This telescope launched last Christmas and the gifts have finally arrived. And I'm terrified, we are so small in the universe. What is going on? In the cluster of photos, we see a giant exoplanet called Wasp 96. And no, it is not full of wasps. I mean, I hope not, who's to say? But it could hold secrets behind human existence. Wasp 96 is a gas planet half the size of Jupiter, 1,150 years away from us. It orbits its star every three to five days, so I hope you love New Year's parties because you're gonna have a lot of them. Thanks to our boy James Webb up there in space, we can now see that there's lots of water surrounding this planet. Clouds and haze, says NASA, that's good. I'm excited for more water to be found in the universe, but I'm also nervous, because you know, more water means more fish, and you know, also f aliens. Number nine, Kepler 1649C. Yeah, it's not all about James Webb today, okay? NASA's Kepler Space Telescope also discovered this one a while back, but while NASA was revisiting old observations in 2018 before, you know, retiring said telescope, they noticed previous computer algorithms misidentified it. And upon second glance, it's indeed an exoplanet. Yep, 300 light years away from Earth, it's a tad larger than our planet, and it receives a good amount of starlight. It receives about 75% of what our own sun gives off. Thing is, Kepler 1649c orbits a red dwarf, meaning solar flare-ups could prevent further life from evolving, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, I don't know. No aliens, please, thanks. Number eight, Ross 128b. I love the names for all these exoplanets. It's just like Jake 21a, you're like, okay. Potentially habitable, so much monster energy. Back in 2017, this exoplanet was discovered by Xavier Bonfils at the Institute of Planetology and Astrophysics of Grenoble. Now this one is 11 light years away from us, it's pretty close, and it only takes 10 days to complete a trip around its M-type star. The star is redder, cooler, and dimmer, so perhaps this planet could one day host life. Or maybe it one day already did. Who's to say? Either way. Don't want it. Don't want any part of these aliens. Number seven, Ice Moon. We're looking billions of years into the past, we're searching cosmic clouds light years away, but what about our own galaxy? What about our own solar system? What about our own moon? Could there one day be life on our moon? Back in 2018, NASA confirmed that there is surface ice on the moon's north and south pole. 
This was huge. NASA Mineralogy Mapper instruments picked up ice traces near the darkest and coldest craters of the rock. There are three specific signatures that prove that there is 100% water ice on the surface of moon. Yeah, and we're talking about aliens whipping out of our oceans. Like what's going on here? Something's, something's afoot. Number six, Loveland Flaming Thing. Nice, that's a good title. Imagine opening the newspaper back in 1957 and on the front cover you read, Leveland Flaming Thing Brings World Knocking at City's Door. That's alarming, that's a pretty crazy one. What does that even mean, right? Back in 1957 in Leveland, Texas, multiple eyewitness reports began to flood in about an egg-shaped object or this circular flash of light something, something egg-like, jetting across Leveland skies. I just like saying Leveland, if I'm being honest. I'm trying to say it as many times as I can. I'm probably saying it wrong, it's probably like Leland, but I'm gonna keep going with Leveland. One witness recalls the object making a loud humming noise as it flew by, which is different than other accounts that we've heard so far for, you know, UFOs. The egg shape keeps coming back in history, right? We've seen this in multiple accounts, but this is an encounter where it's been reported as loud with a great rush of wind. And on top of that claim, the witness's car radio began to go haywire. It was like, you know, it was like, in case you missed it the first time. The radio thing isn't too crazy. I mean, growing up, my computer speakers would always tell me if a phone call was about to come in. Felt like I was from the future. That was always odd. The Air Force also commented on it, saying that this was just a phenomenon caused by electrical storms. It was a ball of lightning, they say. Ball of lightning, back in 1957. Crazy, haven't seen many of those since. Number five, 2017 UFO. Ah, I remember this one, because I was really scared. Not sure what was happening with the universe. Back in 2017, after the existence of the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program became more well known, a video was then released of an encounter between an F-A-18 Super Hornet and some sort of unidentified flying object. A UFO, or a UAP, sorry. We don't say UFOs anymore, now it's a UAP. There weren't a ton of details released about what exactly happened during this encounter because there weren't any details to provide, but the Raytheon Advanced Targeting Forward Locking Infrared, or I'll <laughs> at Fleur if you're out of breath like me. They were able to capture an extremely fast moving white oval that was around 45 feet long. The oval had no wings and didn't appear to have any kind of exhaust either. They were tracking a UFO at the altitude of 25,000 feet just above the Atlantic Ocean. And then they were shocked because the craft rotated on its side and then just flew away. There was no explanation released with the footage because it truly is unbelievable and no one can figure it out yet. If you have any ideas, sound off below. All these mystery eggs floating in and out of our towns. Number four, Europa life. One of Jupiter's moons called Europa has a red tinge around it. And in 2001, NASA scientists revealed that it's possible that alien microbes may be responsible for said red tinge. The surface of its moon is mostly icy, but it has been shown that it reflects infrared radiation in a bizarre way. This means that something is binding it together, but researchers haven't been able to come up with the correct combination of elements and compounds to make this data make any sense. Know what I mean? There's some bacteria on Earth that can thrive in extreme conditions, some fish that have never seen lights ever and they're glowy somehow. The surface temperature might be too cold for them to survive, but the warmer interior might be where they're all located. Some geological activity on the moon could then push them closer to the surface where they then flash frozen in place. What a horrible way to go. Number three, Venus cloud. Back in September 2020, astrobiologists everywhere were excited but also skeptical at some new potential evidence that had been found in the upper clouds of Venus. You probably heard about this, right? Firstly, can we just take a second to really think about how cool of a job it is to be an astrobiologist? To just be like, yep, aliens, let's do it. And then they plan a mission and then take off. Anyways, phosphine is very rare and usually it's poisonous gas here on Earth that is basically always met with the presence of living organisms, right? So we find this gas, it's bad, but always connects with life. Venus hasn't really been at the top of the list for choices for finding potential life due to its surface temperature, of course, and pressure to the, you know, sulfuric acids and the clouds and it's horrible and you can never live there ever. But this new evidence could prove to say something otherwise. Two separate telescopes were able to pick up the signatures of phosphine in a cloud that had a similar temperature and pressure to Earth. And while this isn't concrete evidence of, you know, space beings or bugs or anything like that, it'll at least be a reminder that we should be continuing to look for life or clues around life. You know what I mean? Even in the most unlikely places like Venus clouds. Maybe it's space bugs also. Who knows? That'd be gross. Space moths that live in clouds of phosphine. That would suck. Number two. 
Astronaut sightings. We could sit on Earth all day and talk about the potential for said alien life, but who would know more than the people who have actually been to space, right? I mean, who am I? I'm just a guy who makes YouTube videos. Ask the people who have been out there, which are of course astronauts. Ask astronauts. That'd be a cool website, Ask Astronauts. It probably is the website, actually. Definitely on the list of the coolest and scariest jobs in the entire world. There haven't been a ton of people who have had the you know privilege of experiencing space firsthand, but there are even less of them who have claimed to see something that could potentially prove alien existence. People who have claimed these sorts of things include Edgar Mitchell, Catherine Coleman, and Dr. Brian O'Leary. The very interesting part about many of these claims is that they will also include some sort of government cover-up as well with their claim. So it's always pretty juicy. There was also Buzz Aldrin, who spoke about his Apollo 11 experience, and he detailed the crew seeing something flying alongside them, but at first they believed it was the final stage of a detached rocket. But then Mission Control confirmed that that rocket was actually 6,000 miles away from them at the time, so there was no answers on what said flying object could have been. But they noticed it, as would you in a spaceship looking out of a window. And finally, number one, moon life. Titan is one of Saturn's many moons. Saturn has 82 moons, so if there's any aliens hiding near Saturn, we're never gonna find them. They have many places to hide. A lot of nooks and crannies to hide behind. A lot of moons to hide behind. That's a lot of moons. And around 10 years ago, NASA's Cassini spacecraft detected water under its massive shell of ice, which is really exciting. Again, like I said with our own moon, even traces of water is amazing, let alone this much. To quote a Cassini team member, the search for water is an important goal in solar system exploration, and now we've spotted another place where it is abundant. NASA has also detected low frequency radio waves on the icy moon, and it sounds pretty eerie. So we have radio waves and we have water. Sounds like aliens to me, my friends. As far as space mysteries go, anywhere that has water or signs of water, fish. Some sort of alien fish is hiding in there. Look at our own planet. Look at an octopus. An octopus changes colors while it dreams. Alien. Right, kicking things off now, at number 10, we've got a diamond planet. In 2012, astronomers announced that a planet they had known about for a while, called 55 Canary E, was made out of diamond. Well, at least a third of it was. Scientists were shocked because this was the first rocky planet that wasn't covered in granite and water. They actually think its surface is made up of graphite and diamonds, as far as the eye could see. Its radius is almost twice that of Earth, so if scientists are right about this, that's a whole lot of bling bling. And if you want to get your hands on some, it's only about 40 light years away and with our current technology, that will only take you about 860,000 years to get there, roughly. I still think there are diamond obsessed people out there who would be totally down for that journey. Alright, moving on to number 9 now, we have tarigrades. In 1773, Johann Goes discovered a microscopic animal called tarigrades. Now these 1mm creatures are insanely tough. They've been dragged to the highest mountains, the deepest oceans, and every hot and cold climate you can think of, and they just don't die. They refuse to. Oh, and if you try and starve or dehydrate them, well, good luck. They can live for at least 30 years without food or water. Scientists were like, this. What even are these things? Let's take them into space. Surely, surely they can't survive in space, right? So they dehydrated some of them and took them into space in 2007 and exposed them to the vacuum of space and its intense radiation that would kill a human like me or you in about a minute. They did this for about 10 days and when they took them back to Earth and hydrated them again, they were pretty much fine. They were just okay. The majority of them just woke up and carried on like nothing had happened and if this discovery wasn't so fascinating, it would be annoying. They're kind of annoyingly tough. Maybe it's both. Maybe they're fascinatingly annoying. Alright, next up at number 8, we have got the wow signal. Wow. On August 15th, 1977, astronomer Jerry Emmon was monitoring a radio telescope at the SETI project, which stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So he was basically looking for aliens. After years of signals that didn't seem to be alien at all, everything changed on this day. Jerry noticed on the telescope printout that there was a huge spike of a signal that was unlike anything they had ever seen. And stronger than anything they'd ever recorded. It lasted for a full 72 seconds. Jerry was astounded and quickly circled it with a red pen and wrote wow next to it. As news of the signal from space started to spread around the world, it became known as the wow signal. Everybody went crazy and obviously started talking about aliens right away. They found where the signal came from in space, they located it, an area in the Sagittarius constellation, and they listened again and again and again and again but 
nothing. They tried more than 50 times to pick up any signal at all. People around the world have actually been pointing their telescopes to this place in the stars ever since then, but it's just been total silence. Now, some say it was aliens, some say it was the reflection of an Earth based signal, but for many people, we'll never really know what the wow signal really was. And you know what? That's still pretty cool. All right, moving on to number seven now. Let's talk about space alcohol. Now, in 1995, scientists discovered Sagittarius B2, a very distant and very massive cloud of alcohol. Yeah. Billions of litres of the stuff is just floating out there in an area about 1,000 times the size of our own solar system. It's insanely huge. They analysed all the data and found that the cloud contained ethyl formate. That's a substance that gives raspberries their flavour and rum its smell. So essentially, this cloud would kind of taste of raspberry and smell like rum, apparently. But before you guys start picturing these huge floating galaxies of raspberry cocktails and Jamaican rum, most of it is not drinkable alcohol. It's made mainly of methanol. And that's the same thing you find in polish and windshield washer fluid. So you don't want to drink that. Scientists think it formed when ethyl alcohol got caught up in the creation of a new star. It boiled and separated into this gas cloud. And they're excited because these complex organic molecules are rare to find in outer space and could be our best bet yet for finding life somewhere out there. But personally, I'm excited because yeah, there's kind of a massive raspberry rum space cocktail waiting for me somewhere out there. Okay, at number six, now we have asteroid rings. Now, if I told you to picture something in space with rings around it, you'd probably say Saturn. Uranus also has them. Even Jupiter and Neptune have slightly visible ones. But in 2014, out beyond Saturn, scientists found an asteroid known as Chariklo with two thin rings around it. This totally shocked astronomers because up until that point, they had presumed that only huge things like those planets we mentioned could have rings around them, not tiny little asteroids. It's kind of like presuming that only massive fat guys can be sumo wrestlers and then finding a tiny baby that's wrestling with the best of them. Like, whoa, 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 aren't you a tiny bit small for that? In fact, astronomers think that Chariklo got its rings from debris left over after a massive collision and that they might have been formed with the help of a tiny moon. What's going on? Apparently asteroids now have rings around them and they have their own moons, apparently, and pretty soon they'll probably have drive throughs and Facebook and Matthew McConaughey. All right, moving on to number five now, we have a rogue planet. Now, in 2012, scientists found CFBDSIR2149. Yeah, I think that might be his nickname. It's about 100 light years away from our own solar system, and it does not orbit any other star. It's just drifting through deepest, darkest space, all by itself. It's also massive. They think it's between four to seven times the mass of Jupiter. I think it's kind of scary to picture being on a planet that is just floating through the absolute darkness of outer space. No daytime, just constant night. Although it wasn't the first rogue planet the scientists think they've found, it is the closest one to us that we know of. Because of this, they could narrow its age down to between 50 to 120 million years, and they think it has a temperature of about 400 degrees Celsius. Now, it is one of the better known rogue planets, but scientists do think there could be billions of them out there just drifting in the darkness. All right, coming in at number four now, we have planet HD 189733b. Again, I think that might be its nickname. It's about 63 light years away. It looks quite nice, doesn't it? It's got a very nice blue hue to it. Well, that's not a blue ocean you guys are seeing. It's a massive gas giant. It's very hot. Only one side of it ever faces its star and uh, it rains liquid glass sideways at over 7,000 kilometers an hour. Huh? Oh, yeah. It rains liquid glass at 7,000 thousand kilometers an hour sideways. So the planet is just 4.6 million kilometers away from its own star, which is very close. In fact, the pull on the planet is so strong that it's tidally locked, which means it cannot turn at all. One side is always facing the star. The other is always darkness. Now this causes very hot winds of a thousand degrees Celsius to whip from one side to the other, which causes silicate particles there to condense into small drops of glass that rain down and they're then whipped sideways at over 7,000 kilometers an hour. It's very cool, but uh, 
I don't think we should move there. I'm, I'm quite good here. All right, at number three now, we've got the great red spot. Now look at this image of Jupiter. It's very recognizable, and I'm sure you guys recognize this, the great red spot. But a lot of people don't realize that it's actually a massive storm the size of three planet Earths that has been raging for at least a few hundred years. In fact, we aren't really sure how long it's been going at all. It was first observed scientifically in 1879, but there have been reports of it going way back to 1664. Everyone has been pretty amazed by this. Think of the size of our planet and every piece of land and ocean and person in it. The whole thing could fit three times into this single storm that has been going on for hundreds of years. It could even be longer, but we just couldn't see it. And for all this time we've been observing it, we still don't really know why it's still there. From what we know about storms here on Earth, they eventually do disappear. But the great red spot seems to be feeding off other tiny storms and getting new energy delivered to it to just keep going and going. Oh, and also scientists are still trying to figure out why it's even red in the first place. Yeah, they don't really know. So next time you guys think that zit on your face is the biggest mystery spot in the universe, don't worry. Uh, the great red spot is a lot stranger. Okay, next up at number two, we have the super void. Now, we've talked a lot about strange things out there in space, but what about strange nothings? Well, in 2015, astronomers announced the discovery of a massive area of the universe, about 1.8 billion light years across, with, well, Nothing in it, really. In an area that size, they expected to find about 10,000 galaxies, but they just weren't there. And technically, this place shouldn't even exist. Now, although there is some matter there, scientists never expected to find an area so big with so little. And what I find strange as well is that even though this super void is mainly just nothing, it is something, just like a hole is a thing. In fact, one scientist described this object of nothingness as possibly the largest individual structure ever identified by humans. And it just adds to the argument that we know nothing. Well, I know nothing, you know, but scientists also know nothing. But at least we know we know nothing. Alright guys, we've reached the end now, and finally at number one, we have the sound of the Big Bang. Now in 1964, two astronomers called Robert W. Wilson and Arno A. Panzias were picking up a lot of odd buzzing noises coming from the hold male horn antenna where they were working. It seemed to come from all parts of the sky around them, all day and all night, non-stop. They tried to get rid of it by tuning their instruments and you know, correcting it, and at one point they thought it was being caused by two pigeons that had nested in the actual antenna and were pooping everywhere. But after they had cleaned out the poop and tried everything, the noise was still there all the time. Eventually, they realized that they were actually hearing cosmic microwave background radiation. That's the echo of the Big Bang. What they were essentially hearing was the leftover noise from the birth of the actual universe. Light from that event had been traveling across the universe for so long and so far that it had eventually become radio waves that were everywhere. Now some of the static you see on your TV when you turn it on in between channels is that very same thing. Robert and Arno won a Nobel Prize for confirming the Big Bang theory. Although some people think it could still have been pigeon poop. Maybe. In our number 10 spot, we have The Grey Thing. This is a story told by an anonymous online user that claims to be an astronaut who once saw an alien in an underground US base. Take it with a grain of salt, but I wanted to include it because the story was super interesting to read. He claimed to have been traveling through a US base that he didn't want to name as there is only a number of people allowed in and he doesn't want to be tracked. Anyways, at this base, he saw a grey person that was quite definitely not from this planet. Also when out in space, he had seen a fleet of aircraft that he knew were UFOs, but he didn't think we had any contact with them yet. It wasn't until that moment that he realized that not only do we have contact with them, the aliens are actually already living among us. Interesting. Well, there are so many quote unquote whistleblowers that have mentioned gray people, so this story could be true. What do you think? 
In our number nine spot, we have the flying saucer. Astronaut Deke Slayton revealed in an interview in 1951 that he had seen UFOs. Technically not in space, but obviously the UFO would have come from space, so I wanted to include this one. He said that he was testing a P-51 fighter and flying at about 10,000 feet in Minneapolis when he spotted something strange in the distance. It was gray and kind of looked like a kite, but a kite wouldn't be flying this high, he thought. As he got closer, he saw that it was like a saucer, a disc. He eventually realized that it was starting to move away from him, and then as quick as a blink, it pulled about a 45 degree climbing turn and then accelerated and disappeared. You can see why I wanted to include this one. In our number eight spot, we have UFO in orbit. Astronauts James Lavelle and Frank Borman have claimed to have seen a UFO during the second orbit on the Gemini. There have been many skeptics around this claim, and they usually say that it was probably the Titan booster rocket that was at its final stage. However, Lavelle has replied to this claim, saying that he could also see the booster rocket nearby when he saw the UFO. The exchange initially reported went as follows. Lavelle. Bogey at 10 o'clock high. NASA employee. This is Houston. Say again, Seven. Lavelle said we have a bogey at 10 o'clock high. NASA employee. Gemini 7, is that the booster or is that an actual sighting? Lavelle, we have several actual sighting. NASA employee. Estimated distance or size? Laval. We also have the booster in sight. Ooh, well, I don't know how the skeptics got around that, but skeptics are pretty committed to believing their own narrative about life in the universe, so oh well, let's let them stay in their boring world. In our number seven spot, we have enormous babies. There have been many reports from NASA employees of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin seeing aliens when they first arrived on the moon. Even though Buzz and Neil deny it, I'm sure they have been told to deny it, if you know what I mean. A former NASA employee by the name of Otto Binder bypassed NASA's broadcasting and picked up the following being said. NASA, what's there, Apollo 11? Response, these babies are huge, sir. Enormous, oh my god. You wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out there. Lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. Apparently, off the record, the astronauts have admitted to many scientists that they did indeed see something. Yeah, I believe it. It's silly to think that there is nothing out there. That's just, you know, human ego, I think, to believe that we are the only intelligent life. That mixed with human fear. In our number six spot, we have the lights. Of course, I couldn't have a list without the strange space light phenomena on it. An entire crew at the International Space Station in 2005 witnessed a set of strange lights projecting across space. Commander Leroy Chow has commented on this strange sighting and said that the light was in a weird formation as if it were an upside down V shape. The crew and Chow saw this fleet of lights in the shape of an upside down V fly past them. It would be one thing if it were just one person, but an entire crew witnessed this. That's a lot of people that would be lying. So personally, I think that's all the proof we need, folks. There is other intelligent life out there and they may be close by. Perhaps they're already here and running our government. You decide. In our number five spot, we have alien interaction. This one needed to be included on the list because it's really just suspicious. Very sus. Apparently, Scott Kelly, a well-known astronaut and most notably known for spending a very, very long time on the International Space Station, the longest an astronaut has ever spent there, actually. But anyways, Scott has been known to make quite a few jokes about the things he's seen out there, and we have to wonder, are they really jokes, or was he told not to speak his truth? He was quoted as once saying that aliens have it easier in space than we do. First off, someone's gotta teach this man what a joke is, cause it's missing a punchline. And second, what does that mean? What makes you say something like that? There must be some weird truth behind it. Anyways, I'm convinced that he's seen aliens. What about you? Let me know in the comment section. 
below. In our number four spot, we have a fleet of UFOs. Allegedly, astronaut Gordon Cooper is another one who has reported seeing UFOs in space. If you haven't heard of Gordon Cooper before, then you should know that he flew both the Mercury 9 and the Gemini 5, so he's really had quite a lot of time in outer space. Apparently, he is now coming out and saying that around the time he flew for the Air Force, he saw a fleet of UFOs. Apparently, not more than 10 years later, he came across a similar scene. Allegedly, in 1963, one of them flew towards him, and to back up his statement, he has proof because it was picked up by the radar. Whoa. Also, what would be his reasoning for making this up? To gain fame? Nah. Well, I mean, it's possible, but he would have already gained some clout just by being an astronaut in space, so I feel like that's probably not likely, but anyways, I believe him. He's gone on to say that, quote, I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet and other planets. Most astronauts were reluctant to discuss UFOs. I did have occasion in 1951 to have two days of observation of many flights of them, of different sizes, flying in fighter formation, generally from east to west over Europe. Fascinating. In our number three spot, we have the cylindrical object. Allegedly in 1991, a cosmonaut by the name of Musa Menarov caught a cylindrical object on film that he believed to be a UFO. The object was shiny and in the film, it swivels and flies across space. Originally, Musa thought it was something off the ship, but then after further investigation, nothing was missing from the ship. So after further reflection on seeing it and you know looking back at the footage, he's convinced it was some kind of UFO ship or UFO device. What's with all the UFO objects that are so shiny? Do you think this is a UFO? Or perhaps is it something from another planet? Let us know in the comment section below. Coming up in our number two spot, we have the mystery hut. The ending to this made me lol so hard that I had to include it. A mystery hut was discovered by China's astronauts and people operating their U-2-2 moon rover. This rover was making its way through the northwestern part of the moon when it was discovered. On the camera, a cubed shaped mystery hut was captured. This was only in November of 2021. It created a spectacle. Had moon people finally been discovered? Everyone was asking themselves. By January 2022, the rover was much closer. And what did it find? Oh, just a small piece of space rock on a crater rim. <laughs> The drama. Ooh, look, a mystery hut. Probably the moon men reside there. One month later. Alas, it is a rock. Humans are funny. <laughs> In our number one spot, we have UFO footage. Recently in 2020, Russian astronaut, cosmonaut Ivan Wagner made a time-lapse video while orbiting space and he claimed to have found something. Space guests, he called them. In his video, you see the curved edge of the Earth at night with a green swirl of the aura moving across the surface and several falling stars. It's such a cool video to see. Then, about nine seconds in, you see a fleet of five possible UFOs. He said that because it's in a time-lapse format. You can't measure how long they were there, but in real life, it was for about 50 seconds in real life time. This video is so crazy. Honestly, even if it's not alien fleets, to see such a beautiful sight with the falling stars is just unreal. It must be incredible to be an astronaut. <laughs> Starting off at number 10 now, we have the smiley face. In February 2015, NASA published this extraordinary picture showing a cluster of galaxies that undoubtedly looks like a face. It almost looks too good to be true, like someone photoshopped it, but it is 100% legitimate. The picture was taken by NASA's Deep Space Hubble Telescope. They said in a statement, galaxy clusters are the most massive structures in the universe and exert such a powerful gravitational pull that they wrap the spacetime around them and act as cosmic lenses which can magnify, distort and bend the light behind them. This phenomenon, crucial to many of Hubble's discoveries can be explained by Einstein's theory of general relativity. So yeah, basically that distortion and magnification is what's causing the outline of the face and the mouth. In scientific terms, this is called an Einstein ring. Those eyes aren't actually stars either. They are entire galaxies with over 100 billion stars in them. Traveling across just one of them at the speed of light would take hundreds of thousands of years. I could go on with that, but we've only just 
just started. Don't want to blow your minds just yet. Moving on to number nine now, we have the man on Mars. 1976, the Viking 1 orbiter passed over the surface of Mars and sent back pictures to Earth. The scientific community were fascinated by all of them, but one picture in particular caught people's attention. This one. Everyone who saw it saw the face, but what exactly was it? Viking 1 took this picture on its 35th orbit of Mars at an altitude of 1,162 miles. The face rises up from the surface of Mars to 2,600 feet, over twice the height of the Empire State Building. It's also 1.6 miles wide and 1.2 miles long. Conspiracy theorists believe that the face is a structure made by an ancient civilization who lived on Mars long before it became uninhabitable to complex life. NASA obviously rejects this and says that the face is nothing more than a trick of the light and some shadows. The conspiracy theorists have disagreed though and still maintain there is a lot more to this face on Mars than meets the eye. Moving on to number eight now, we have the Sumerian. In 2015, this picture started doing the rounds online. Now at first, it might not look like much, but UFO hunters believe it's the head of a fallen statue. Specifically, that it looks like an ancient Sumerian statue that you'd expect to find in ancient Mesopotamia, right here on Earth. They point to the two eyes, the nose, the mouth, and the typical cone-shaped beard of Sumerian statues. Now some people have taken this to the absolute extreme and believe that ancient beings may have colonized both Mars and Earth. That's why there's a similarity in the beards. It's quite a far-fetched theory, I won't lie, and uh, yeah, NASA denies it, of course. Moving on to number seven now, we have the smiley face. We are returning to Mars again for this one. This is the smiley face that was spotted by the Viking 1 orbiter, the same mission that took the picture of the other face on Mars that we talked about earlier. Smiley face is a little bit less controversial though. Nobody, I think, is claiming that it's the product of some ancient civilization, but it is pretty interesting to look at. From directly above, the smiley face looks a lot like the famous yellow happy face sticker. I'm sure you know the one I mean. In reality though, the face is made up of a cluster of mountains inside the Galley Crater, with the rim of the crater forming the outline of the face. Moving on to number six now, we have the crowned face. This is a famous face that's also referred to as the king's face. You're about to see why. The 11 mile wide long feature was spotted in the Libya Monte region of Mars. It's not just a face that sticks out with this picture, it's that crown too. Some people see the face as that of a woman looking to the left, while others see a few different layered faces. Interestingly, the feature that makes this face aren't actually as heavily shadowed as others we've talked about on this list so far, so it can't just be as easily dismissed as just a trick of the light. Moving on to number five now, we have the Space Invader. In 2013, the Hubble telescope snapped this spiral galaxy that looks a lot like the face of a Space Invader. It's quite a strange sight to see. This galaxy is over two billion light years away. That means the light we see from it took two billion years to get here, and to us, it looks like the creature from a classic 1970s video game. I wonder if there is intelligent life somewhere in that galaxy. It's strange to think that they will probably never meet us, and uh, all we ever know about their galaxy is that it looks like a space invader. What a strange universe we live in. Moving on to number four now, we have the Meridiani face. This is one of the lesser known faces seen on the surface of Mars. It can be found on the Meridiani planum, near the planet's equator, and some people believe it's of course evidence of intelligent creation. The two eyes looked closed, or perhaps they're squinting. There's a large nose and two sharp looking cheekbones as well. I don't know about everyone else, but to me, it kind of looks like the face is submerged underwater, or as if it's underneath like a frozen lake of ice. Kind of creepy. I just hope it doesn't open its eyes. That would be very freaky indeed. Moving on to number three now, we have Jovi. Now that is the nickname given to this picture that shows a pretty disturbing face across the surface of Jupiter. The stormy surface of Jupiter is always shifting and changing throughout time, but I imagine none of you have ever seen it quite like this. This image was processed by amateur scientist Jason Major. Now he jokingly titled it Jovi McJupiter Face. He produced the image by rotating it 180 degrees and orienting it from one side to the south side, if that makes sense. By doing that, the two huge oval storms become the eyes and this creepy face of Jupiter is revealed. Moving on to number two now, we have the woman on Mars. In 2007, NASA's Spirit Rover delivered this image showing what looks like a person strolling through the Martian sands. Some have said that specifically, it looks like a woman. NASA admitted that although it looks like a person, it's not actually a person at all. This masked strolling figure is actually a craggy rock formation. Of course, conspiracy theorists disagree with this. They admit that the figure is probably made out of rock, but they say it's the statue of a female figure made by aliens. The Planetary Society was quick to call the object an optical illusion and an example of pareidolia. The tendency for our 
our minds to assign familiar patterns to random shapes or sounds. I think that might just pretty much sum up this whole video. And finally, number one now, we have the goblin. That's the name that I'm giving this face that was spotted inside a cave on Mars by NASA's Curiosity rover. This picture was taken in 2016 and quickly spread across the internet. UFO hunters started discussing the possibility of it being an alien creature. Scott Waring, editor of UFO Sightings Daily, believes that this is an important find. He spends hours every day going through the many images that NASA publishes online. Mr. Waring told his followers that if this really was a creature in the cave, then it would be about three inches in height by his calculation. Hmm, a three inch Martian. Now, that's possible, but as with many of the others on our list, this creepy face may just be a rock. I don't know.